Hello, my name is Ryan Salins, and I'm here with Dr. Gina Mora at Nebraska Medicine, and this is going to be the third and final video of a series looking at reproductive and sexual health and the transgender community, specifically looking at transgender men or people on the transmasculine spectrum. Um, th in this last video, we're going to actually talk about what happens after the pelvic and anal exam are done uh, when looking at results and things that we commonly may see that could be health concerns um, and things that actually aren't health concerns but that you should be aware of. Uh, so I'm going to turn it to you, Gina, to talk about after you completed the pap smear and you get results back, what are things that you commonly yeah. see? So the, the main spectrum of, of results that we get is that the majority are going to come back as normal and then we see a, a scaling of abnormal kind of from mild to severe. Mm -hmm. um, there's a potential that the pap smear could actually come back saying that there's direct cause for concern for cancer, but that's not usually the case. And really this is where the great value of the pap smear comes in, is that it picks up pre-cancer changes in the cervix. Um, so that it's not just that you're finding out about a cancer early, you're actually finding something, a problem before it's cancer. So if the pap smear comes back with a result saying that there is mild change, then the provider's probably going to recommend that you have follow-up sooner than the three-year interval that we talk about just as standard screening. They're going to do it sooner than that. If, they, if it comes back with severe abnormal, abnormal changes, but again, it's still pre-cancer, that's a situation where they're going to want to do um, further evaluation, starting with colposcopy, which is a, like the exam that we just showed, like, a, like having the, the pap smear pelvic exam done, but um, actually taking a small biopsy. The whole thing is, you know, is probably more like a 15, 10 to 15 minute exam. Mm -hmm. Um, but just to bear in mind that if they do happen to see that in the recommending colposcopy, it's because they're seeing something that is potentially going to turn into cancer if it's left untreated. So it really does deserve your attention. You can tell them that you are terribly concerned about having the exam done and your doctor can work with you on how to make it more comfortable, how to, you know, make it less anxiety provoking and all those things but don't ignore it if it's an abnormal because okay. you're in that group where you really want to catch it while while it's um, in an early phase something that comes up a lot for people is that a report can come back they get the report from it and it may list dysplasia of the cervix or atrophy of the tissue and i know for some trans men hearing dysplasia of the cervix or atrophy of the tissue yeah. is very alarming to them and they're concerned could you actually explain what that means yeah so d there are two very different things did the term dysplasia is the abnormality that's a pre-cancer so that's one category so that's going to be a situation where you're, the provider who did the pap test is going to say this needs further evaluation. Um, if it is atrophy, that is actually a pretty common finding that we see um, in people that have very low estrogen levels. So that's actually just referring to the, what we're getting in the pap smear is just a sampling of cells that have basically fallen away from the cervix. Um, and those, they're looking at those cells, they're kind of like skin cells, and they're seeing that they're very thin. And they're thin because they don't have a lot of estrogen, which is in fact exactly what I would expect for a trans guy on testosterone. Um, for someone who's taking testosterone, m my expectation would be that their vaginal and cervical cells will be atrophic or atrophied. Okay. Um, we do sometimes uh, get back results on people that are on testosterone because of that atrophy that they'll actually report back they can't see enough cells in the sample and then are asking for a repeat sample. Um, we can sometimes try to minimize that chance if we actually alert the lab ahead of time. Please know that this person's on testosterone and that there's, there's likely to be fewer samples. But just so that you have in mind that that is still, even with my best efforts, I still get that result back. Not infrequently with people that are on testosterone. And if you get those results, 
you, do you schedule another appointment or do you just recognize they're on testosterone so this is what we expect to see so that appointment's not needed? If we if they actually say that they're not able to read the, the uh, lab because there's insufficient amount of material, then I'd recommend another exam. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's why we kind of do everything we can on the front end to minimize the chance of that. But people that are on testosterone definitely have a higher chance of that happening. Okay. Yeah. And I know for many trans men, there's also lots of concerns uh, around either bleeding while beginning T or being on T for, say, even seven to 10 years and experiencing some spotting and concerns around what could be causing that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, yeah, bleeding stopping when people start on testosterone is really one of the things that for most guys they're really looking forward to. And we can pretty, um, you know, Pretty honestly, I think, r advise people that their periods, if they're having periods leading up to being on testosterone, that they're probably gonna stop within the first few months. And we expect virtually everybody to stop having periods by about month six. Um, if they're taking testosterone you know, consistently that whole time. So if someone is continuing to have bleeding after, the, after six months on testosterone, then we frequently will start to look at needing to evaluate that as to why that is going on. That might involve a pelvic exam, um, might involve a pelvic ultrasound um, to, to look at why that's going on. Um, for people that are, have been on T for a while, have stopped bleeding as expected, and everything's going fine, and then they start having bleeding again, it can be for a couple of different reasons. The, the few that are most common would be actually atrophy, there's that word again, mm -hmm. of the, either from, of the vagina or of the uterus. And so, because like we'll see this in, say, in cis women, postmenopausal, their bodies stopped making estrogen many you know, years or a decade ago, and then they start to have a little bit of light bleeding. And so we've got a pretty good knowledge of this just from all of the experience in that population. But it's not terribly different in trans guys or people that are taking testosterone. They've got very low estrogen and that lining inside the uterus gets very thin. So it's almost like, um, like skin that has like little cracks in it. Like you picture your skin in the winter and it gets almost like it can get those little cracks that just you know barely are bleeding. And it's sort of like that. So if someone's having light bleeding, just spotting, and they've been on T for a while, that would be the first thing that I would think of as a potential cause. If they're having bleeding that is routinely related to any kind of penetration, mm -hmm. then I would think that there's, again, probably it's from atrophy, but now more of the vaginal area, lower down. Um, or it could be that there's something actually on the cervix that every time there's any kind of penetration, that's getting kind of bumped, mm -hmm. and then they have bleeding from that. So in that situation, that'd probably be a, a situation where I would really recommend doing an exam to look and see, is there something that we need to evaluate, or maybe that we could easily treat. Mm -hmm. um, but to just get a sense, rather than assuming that it's from the typical hormonal changes from being on testosterone. The last thing that I would think of, um, or, or I guess the next thing I would think of in terms of why this might be going on for someone on testosterone, is that we know that in some people, as they're on particularly higher levels of testosterone, it can, the body can convert it to estrogen. And so they might inadvertently be exposed to higher levels of estrogen than we were thinking. And that's got a whole different, you know, potential um, kind of cascade of issues that can go on. So. Mm -hmm. There's, there, it definitely is something that you would want to bring up to a provider that they're likely going to want to do an exam for so they can help narrow down which of these things is more likely and what sort of treatment is going to make sense because it could be that there's too little estrogen mm -hmm. or that there's too much estrogen or that there's some other underlying problem going on. So it does, it does warrant attention when you're in that group that has, had, has stopped bleeding and then starts to have bleeding again. Right. So really with everything that we're learning, it's just important to pay attention to your body and different signs and symptoms. And when looking at annual pelvic exams, again, even though it can be very uncomfortable to schedule the appointment and to have the exam done, I mean, it's not comfortable for anybody 
that um, this exam is required for, it's really important to do. Uh, and I hope that we can continue to have more and more providers that are competent and friendly to the trans community. So thank you so much, Jane, for sharing well, your information today. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah.